we had seven figures coming in. We were making 120 odd thousand dollars a month and we let everybody out of contract. And I had clients, hundreds of them that wanted to be seen by yes. me. And then I had a husband that wanted to be seen by me. And I had really needy parents who wanted to be seen by me. And I just felt like I was drowning. I haven't really spoken about this publicly because I've actually been a little honestly worried about some kickback. We had a lot of uncomfortable conversations where Tim was like, it's like, you don't want me to be here, you know? Yeah. And a part of me was like, I don't. What is up, you beautiful human? Hello, and welcome back to the Raw, Real, and Vulnerable podcast with me, your host, Beck Antonucci. Well, that completes six days and five nights of my signature retreat, the Bali Somatic Expansion Retreat. And it was the most beautiful, heart opening. Ugh, I can't even tell you. I feel like God actually gave me the blueprint of this retreat. And it's so funny. Last year when I ran my very first one, I had this feeling within me of, oh my goodness, Rebecca, you can not get this wrong because women that are definitely not strangers, that know you, like you, trust you, that you have been building relationships with for so many years, women that have been clients of yours for so many years, are flying from all over the world and investing so much to come and spend six days with you. So you better deliver. And I had this moment of nervousness, which I feel is so great because for a while in my life, especially before I'd left Perth and moved to Bali all that time ago, I'd really felt like I'd not put myself on my growth edge. And I love doing new things because you're meant to be a little bit terrified and you're meant to not know the outcome of the thing that you're about to do because you've never been to that place that you're going to before. And as I ran the retreat, I mean, I put so much energy, attention, care, effort, time investment. I mean, the Saturday before I ran my first one, we have a particular day that we do. I'm not going to tell you about it in case you're one of the women that eventually comes to a retreat and there's parts of it that get to stay a secret. But there's a particular day that we do. I had mapped out the entire day, basically hour by hour, and I spent the Saturday driving the entire thing to make sure that my plan was going to work exactly as I envisioned it and planned it. The way that this retreat rolled out the first time around, I thought to myself, I didn't create that. That was actually bigger than me. God gave me this blueprint and it gets to be given to women. I can't not do this retreat again. So if you weren't one of the women that came to the last retreat or the one that we just had over the past week, there is one more happening March 23rd. If Bali Retreat is speaking to you, find out about it, jump in the show notes about it, talk to me about it. I'm really inviting you into it. I don't know when the next set of retreat dates are actually going to be announced because I've got an intuitive feeling my husband will be finding me between October and March, October 20, 2023 to March 2025. It'd be so great if he does find me in that time. I can be like, look, I predicted it. I knew it. So I just want to predict that I'm actually busy <laughs> after March 23rd and I can't lock in any more retreat dates. But today's podcast episode is with my business coach. Her name is Steph Gorton. Steph Gorton has been my business coach for such a long time now. I found Steph after I had been significantly burned by coaches. I know I've shared with you in many podcasts in the past I burned 90000 Australian dollars on business coaching between two different coaches in the second year of my coaching business. In the first year of my coaching business, I grew to $200,000 really quickly. And then I wanted to run before I could walk. And I wanted to keep up. I was in masterminds with different women and I was performing with some of the high performers in the masterminds that I was in. And I wanted to be able to keep up with those women. But those women had had coaching businesses for two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years. I had only just birthed my coaching business. So my second year, I made a very big mistake and it was my responsibility. It isn't the coach's responsibility. Whilst I feel they could have told me that I wasn't ready for the work that they were offering me, I didn't have the infrastructure to create results the way that they were telling me I could create results if I was to sign up to them. The truth is I chose to invest. They didn't grab my bank card. They didn't grab my credit card and put the numbers in. I did that. I chose not to do my due diligence. After that $90,000, I felt really angry with myself and frustrated with the industry and frustrated with business coaches. I didn't know who to turn to. And the only person that I trusted as a coach and a mentor 
in the personal and professional development industry was Preston Smiles. I was like, that's it. I'm never going anywhere else. Now, the thing with living in Perth and having an American mentor is American mentor calls are at 3 a.m. Perth time. And as my business was getting busier, I knew that I didn't want to wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning anymore. Chances would have it that Steph Gorton and I were both speakers at a personal development women's event in Yelling Up, Western Australia. And that's where I met Steph. And she kind of stayed in my sphere. I saw her on Instagram. I saw all the results that she was creating. And I knew that she was Perth-based and I was searching for an Australian coach. And I could see all of the results that she was creating online. Didn't look like one or two results. It looked like consistently across the board, this woman was getting results. And so I messaged Steph. I let her know that I had been really burned and I was scared to reinvest. And could she support me on and in my business journey? And the rest is history. Today, Steph Gorton and I speak about exactly that, what it's like to be burned by the industry, how you can protect yourself so you can smartly invest in your next mentor and or business coach, the due diligence that you have to do and the self-trust that you get to build to know that your next step on and in your entrepreneur journey is a right and aligned step for you. Steph and I dive all the way into a topic that has been untouched, her relationship, dissolving her multi seven-figure coaching business to birth a business with her husband and all of the impacts that had on their relationship and their union from going into business partnership together. We speak about what it was like for Tim to be in relationship with a woman who didn't want to be led. We explore what it was like for Steph to realize that she no longer wanted to lead a business that she knew how to lead so well and to put absolute faith, trust and certainty into her husband and the results that that decision has created, not only for herself, not only for her husband, not only for the both of them as a couple, but for their business and for all of their clients. We speak about the shame and the stigma attached to money and why it's an empowering move for you to honor and acknowledge exactly where you are at in your relationship with money and how no matter where you're at in your money journey, you can create. You will want to stay all the way to the very end because we dive into why so many people want to be an entrepreneur, but the knowing that not all humans are built to be entrepreneurs and Steph shares a secret for you to be able to explore within yourself and discover if you are actually built for the entrepreneur journey. If you love this episode, please screenshot it, share it to your story, tag both myself and Steph because we would absolutely love to connect with you and we would love to share it as well. Don't forget if you much prefer to watch your episodes rather than listen to them, we are now on YouTube. So click subscribe, strap yourself in. This is one hell of an episode. Let's fucking go. I am sitting here in person in Perth, Western Australia with a woman who is incredibly special to me, to my heart, to my friendship, to my business, to my clients, even if they don't actually know who you are (laughs) yet. Stephanie Gordon, Steph- Stephanie Frey. I'm still going by Gordon at the Steph moment. Steph Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> Steph Gordon, welcome back to Raw, Real and Vulnerable. Thank you so much for having me. It's so nice to do this in person. It's so lovely to connect here. Oh, that's what I love about in-studio podcast yeah. recording. It's so different being face-to-face rather mm. than on a screen. Yeah, it's so nice. And maybe I'll just go Stephanie. Like Maybe I'll just be like Stephanie. Madonna. Stephanie Gorton. Yeah. I like Rebecca. Rebecca, though, is only for people who really love me. Yeah. So if I don't like you and you call me Rebecca, I'm like, it's Beck. Oh, okay. Good to know. (laughs) Keep that in mind. I'll keep that in mind. I'll know when I'm in trouble. Yeah, you will. So Stephanie, Steph Gorton, for those who didn't listen to our original episode, and we'll Mm. pop it in the show notes, who is Steph Gorton and what is it that you do in the world? So... I'm Steph Gordon. I am a business coach, but I hate the term. And I think any person that's a business coach probably hates the term at this point. I would say that what I do is a lot deeper and has a lot more depth than that. I like to help people make money, create financial freedom and do it on a trajectory that actually suits them. But something that I guess is about me and who my heart is, like I just grew up really poor and I decided to make a new decision that that wasn't going to be my journey Mm. that, you know, my parents went bankrupt and were really Mm. bad with money. And so for me, it was just really important that I changed the narrative on 
the broke victim mentality that my parents had mm. and I wanted to bring other people on that journey with me and so I think that most of what I do in this lifetime is just to help people to break free of working in day jobs and suffering and actually taking some level of control of their lives mm. you're a wife and a business a, I'm a business wife owner, and a business owner. I have a couple mom. of doggos I like to car- we were just talking about this before I I like to caravan which is a which <laughs> I don't is, know why but she does <laughs> which is a really new thing for me um and if you're watching the video of this so you'll probably be like she doesn't look like she would be a caravanner I don't I'm not usually into that sort of thing but um it's been really a really wholesome experience for us actually mm. and yeah that's a little bit about who I am and I know you were saying from our last podcast episode a lot has changed mm. and you've gone on a huge self-development journey so can you tell us a little bit about that yeah gosh what a journey I think look life is just one big self-development journey I think and as you go through different seasons and you uncover I think especially if you're an entrepreneur and you're listening to this podcast and if you're not that's also fine you'll have different experiences of the same thing but if you're an entrepreneur and you know you hit a milestone there's always another milestone that gets made there's always the next thing you know because we're growth driven and it's it's natural for humans to want more Mm. and so Every level of more, every level has a new devil and every new level that I've hit has definitely had just many ego deaths that have Mm. had to happen along the way. One of those things recently was I partnered with with my husband in business and it was a really big huge shift for me because I didn't realize just how masculine I had been being Mm. until he was right there with me and I was like wow I don't really like who I've become and so it was a really big transition for me recently into being more soft being more feminine um, you know allowing uh, a lot more trust and surrender into my life and so you know, I think if probably last time we spoke, I was probably all about like, yeah, more hustle, like more money. Like, you know, I was pretty like go-getter. Yeah. Um, I'd say now I'm probably in a slightly different season. Yeah. So what was it about having Tim in such close proximity? Because you've been in a relationship with Tim for such a long time, right? Mm. Yeah, totally. So how long have you both been together? We've been together almost 10 years. Yeah. We live and work together. From the same household, we ran separate businesses. So he had his gym and I had my coaching business. And so we ran those separately. Yes. But kind of together right so we talk about them every day the biggest change for us was that like really at the end of the day he did with his business what he did and I did with my business what I did and if he gave me advice it was up to me whether I wanted to take it or leave it yes and I would just go in based on what I wanted to do having a business together Mm -hmm. is really different because one of you has to be the leader because you can't both be the leader yes it doesn't make sense because if you there's too many chefs in the kitchen like if you if he wants to do this and I want to do this how do we decide like who's right who's wrong how do we choose of course I think that my way is better and safer of course he thinks that his way is smarter and safer and so we were constantly butting heads for yeah. quite some time on the direction of the business like we both knew where we wanted to go we just both had different routes to get there and, and do you think because he had a gym and you had a coaching business for such a long time you were just so practiced in you are the leader you were the boss and everything was what you say goes well so much of it like 100 percent, of course like i was the boss how do you I put down that thought it's like yeah. oh, i actually know what's best i've been doing this for years and also like he came into the coaching world so we yes. sold the gym and he came into the coaching world and i was like well you don't know you don't know yeah like, i've been doing this like you don't know yeah which just from a relationship perspective so gross yeah like to tell your husband that he doesn't get it and that he doesn't know it's so demasculating yeah to say those things and to assume that he's effectively was making him feel dumb stupid you know not like i was being grateful you know he wanted to pull in a direction i'd always shoot him down it just didn't work and eventually we honestly i would say like up until probably 18 months ago I don't. I think I can count on one hand how many hard conversations Tim and I have had. Yeah. And in the last eighteen months, I would say that they're almost like every couple of weeks. Wow. Because I'm constantly putting down my sword. I'm constantly putting down yeah. my fight. I'm constantly just like, okay, you just have to let him do the thing and trust him. And we made the decision that he was the leader, and that was a decision that we had to make because honestly, me being the leader was it was just really exhausting. And mm. I think you spoke about this before in your podcast in general. I want to be led. Mm -hmm. I don't actually want to have to make all the decisions. Mm -hmm. I actually love when he leads. It was safety that I had to create both in myself and in our relationship to be able to say, Mm -hmm. if I really do feel unsafe about a decision that's being made, to Mm -hmm. know that it will not land on deaf ears Mm -hmm. and really creating a way and almost a system to have those conversations Mm -hmm. to make sure that I knew that like when I did have something to say that it would be heard. Yeah. So I kind of want to reverse engineer this a bit. Why did you decide to go into business Mm. together first? Obviously these 
conversations have happened after. So what was the deciding factor of, okay, he's dissolving the gyms, selling the gyms, and you two are going into partnership Mm. together? What was that? Yeah, so for some time prior to him selling the gym, he'd been unhappy. Like he was over yeah. it. He was out. He was just done. He'd Fitness been industry is exhausting. challenging. Super exhausting. challenging. And he'd been at 15 years. Yeah. You know, he's got multiple master's degrees. Like he, he, it's done. Like it yes. was like the summit had been climbed. Yes. The next, you know, logical decision was like, oh, he'll buy more gyms. But <laughs> just the thought of it made us want to just like stab ourselves in the eye. Yeah. So we were like, that's definitely not the path. Um, so he was actually going to start his own thing, his own consulting thing on mm-hmm. the side. And I was suffering. I was really suffering in my business at the time. I, I had a multi-million dollar coaching business, mm-hmm. um, which was the Purpose, and, Purpose profit. and Profit Mastermind. Mm-hmm. And I was still coaching you at that point. Mm-hmm. And um, I hated it. I hated it with every fiber of my being. I, I had a lot of team to manage. I had really laid some heavy expectations on what kind of results our clients would get mm-hmm. that I couldn't really hold because they wouldn't do the work and I couldn't force them to do the work and therefore they couldn't get the results. And I felt really responsible Mm -hmm. for that. And would the client project that onto you that I didn't get the results? Yeah. And then I I would take it personally, which I now have learned not to do. Yes. But at the time, it all felt like a really crushing, crumbling, exhausting thing. Like my team wanted me like they needed me they wanted to talk to me every day they wanted a leader that you know wanted to chat with them and have powwows and you know wanted to be seen of course and then I had clients hundreds of them that wanted to be seen by me and then I had you know a husband that wanted to be seen by me and I had really needy parents who wanted to be seen by me and I just felt like I was drowning and so Mm. I knew that that wasn't right for me so I was gonna I was kind of thinking about moving away from this the kind of icing on the cake was we want to have kids Mm. and first one's being called Rebecca and yes yeah <laughs> <laughs> of course <laughs> uh straight after Tim's dancing reel <laughs> and so we wanted to have kids and I thought how does this business run with me not at the helm like right now if I took like a couple of weeks off I think the whole thing would just fall apart yes. so how does this run with me not at the helm yeah what does it look like if I'm not in this business it's going to take years for Tim to get something off the ground mm. under a new personal brand having to build all that up from scratch and so it kind of just made sense eventually that he wants to do consulting, we come in on the business, but I was in my soul very reluctant to give away the brand that I had built. And it was a very soft woman that had built that brand. She was very, I was a little bit more like woo-woo, I would say back mm. then. I probably wasn't, but my persona online was definitely woo-woo. And, and so sweet. I saw so a sweet. photo of us from the public speaking event that we met at and I'm like, Steph looks so different and sweet. And now you're like this sexy shark. Yeah, <laughs> I was just a really, I was really playing good girl. I yes. was really playing good girl. Yeah. I was playing good cop. I was playing like everyone's so safe with me. Yeah. But and was- do you think unconsciously that's to protect yourself from fear of judgment, people projecting at you and people constantly wanting you and being kind to you because they want to, your help to make their money? So the good girl was like, I'll never have arrows being thrown at me if I'm the good girl. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So it was very much the case of, you know, I got bullied quite bad when I was younger Mm -hmm. and I developed the persona of if I'm just super likable and I I did it really well, like everyone loved me, you know? And so I was like, I figured out this effectively manipulation of humans where I was like, I will always be seen as the kind good girl and no one will ever have anything bad to say about me. But the truth was people still have bad shit to say about me. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And I was just suffering because everyone was just throwing their daggers at me anyway because Mm. if you're too nice you get walked over yeah and so it wasn't working right and I knew so the rebrand happened and and I stepped straight into fierce energy I went basically from pink and fluffy and rah rah to like black and serious (laughs) and very like very very swearing basically and so it was a really big transition and the reason that that I did that was really because I was like yeah I, I can't play this good girl anymore I can't play this you know this this role that I've projected online and I need to allow myself to be supported by my husband. And so it was just a really big shake up of everything that I'd done. And so then dissolving PMP entirely, were you experiencing relief and grief at the same time? Was there fear attached to that? Because if you've built a multi seven figure business and you're about to close it down, was there any amount of fear of, what we're stepping into work what was that like for you yeah it was awful so yeah. we made the decision about six months uh three You're selling th- the dream right now <laughs> it's so bad <laughs> everyone do it <laughs> everybody no I yeah, probably, it was awful i probably wouldn't recommend Let me tell you the truth <laughs> i probably wouldn't recommend doing it the way we did it <laughs> fuck i sometimes think like damn like we were so ballsy like 
and we've actually told this story a few times now and to mentors and, and other people and they're like, wow, I can't believe you did it that way. It probably wouldn't have been the way that I'd done it. But I am the kind of person that, and I think you're really similar, Beck. if my heart's not in it anymore, mm-hmm. I'm not just doing myself a disservice by yes. saying in this, I'm doing you a disservice. Because yeah. if I don't want to do it anymore, who's getting the benefit now? Yeah. Because my energy is already one step out the door. Yeah. So when we decided to shut down PMP, we so we had a multi-million dollar business for anyone who's following along. I hated it. And we made the decision about three months prior to shutting it down that we were going to do that. Once we actually shut it down, we moved really quickly. I had to make a lot of redundancies. I had to fire a lot of team members. Mm. We decided that the only fair thing to do was to let all of our clients, we had 100 and maybe 25 clients at the time, Mm -hmm. to let all of them out of contract Mm -hmm. and then to let them make a new decision. So we had seven figures coming in. We were making 100 20 odd thousand dollars a month and we let everybody out of contract we went to zero like 100 percent, we went to zero and i knew that we were doing that and so the weeks leading up to that tim and i were having panic attacks i was taking valium to sleep at night like i was like this feels so unsafe like and my parents went bankrupt so i was like going to zero was like a very visceral mm. experience in my body for me yeah. but the day we actually did it, I felt so much relief and I was so lit up and I was so excited. And then we started selling Success School, which is what we have now. I was so fortunate. Like I feel so, like I could feel like I could cry about it right now. I feel so fortunate that so many beautiful souls mm. decided to, to trust us and jump, make another jump. So, yeah. you know, we ended their contracts. They had a choice. And I think like out of 120, like 82 people said yes within the first month. So we were just like, we were so lucky. We didn't expect anyone to. Yeah. We hoped that yeah. we'd get 30. Like we were like, 30 is our break even number. Like if we could just get 30 people in the first month, we won't yeah. like, you know, lose our mortgage. And so, yeah, we made the jump and it was terrifying. It was yeah. so terrifying, but it's 100% the right thing. What do you feel was the secret sauce in having those 82 people say yes? Oh, I actually didn't feel like I did a very good job in PMP. I wasn't as present. We had a lot of other coaches coaching mm-hmm. and I wasn't as present as I wanted to be. And so I actually really doubted whether they would come. Mm-hmm. I was like, I don't know if they're gonna join us. I think that I probably hadn't given myself enough credit. I think mm-hmm. that we're, we're probably actually very good coaches and, and at the time me especially, I think yes. we were actually a very, very good at coaching. And we had actually got a lot of people, a lot of really incredible results. And so there was no reason. If it wasn't us, where were they gonna go? Mm-hmm. And so I think that goodwill personal brand and we were just really like really honest about the entire process we were Mm. like look this is where it's at this is why i hope that this encourages you if you're ever sitting on the fence about Mm. making a leap to just trust yourself and jump Mm. and i think that people really resonated with the honesty and the transparency behind it we didn't try and bullshit it and and pretend like it was something that it wasn't like Mm. we were like we're unhappy and that's not good for you yeah we've built this this will make us very happy you'll actually get more access to us yes Come over here. Yeah. So they have a choice. Way more access. Whenever Way I tell anyone access. about Success School, I'm like, they're on calls four days a week just so you can you can go four days. If you need business support, you can just receive everyone else's business coaching four days yeah. a week. For 52 weeks a year. For 52 weeks a year we for, from break. two people that have created multiple seven-figure businesses. Yeah. And like people are like, oh, I, I want one-to-one coaching. I'm like, you get more. If you, yeah. if you got on all four calls a week, you would get more time with me than you would if we were one-to-one coaching. Yeah, Steph broke up with me as a one-on-one coach. Just so every like I've never been broken up with. I'm so sorry, by Any man ever. Well, I'm not a man. And this but... bitch breaks up with me. <laughs> I get a voice memo. I'm like, what? I was so I was so devastated about doing it as well. I was like, I was like, yeah, oh, I really so don't. We had so much fun. Calls. And you were so you're such a great client. Like you Beck, if guys, Beck is the best client. She's the full embodiment of what she teaches she really is exactly how she is and like you never make a fuss you never ask for too much you never take too much and so it was really hard like I was like there feels like there's no reason to do this except for at the time I just really needed to stay focused on some other stuff yeah so yeah and I love that because I think there are a lot of coaches and entrepreneurs listening now that could say I want to hold on to something in my business because there is a part of me that really loves it and that I, there's a higher part of me that says I have got to let it go. Mm. The past three months you've supported me through the knowing that I get to let go of true transformation and true transformation is my baby and she creates such phenomenal results and she definitely has never made it as big as PMP but she's just done so many incredible things that just like my soul has said it's time to yeah. close the door on true transformation and to be like, Ugh, are you serious? I think the courage though, yes. and to courage, because yes, you've had courage to do that because it 
it is hard. And especially when you're closing the door, you're like, actually, do I want to close the door? <laughs> like yeah. You start to really question. <laughs> I, I got back with, together with my ex-boyfriend 15,000 times. So I'm... <laughs> I was just about to say that. I was just about to say it's kind of the same with you and your ex. Yeah. Because it's like you can have something great yeah. and it's still not be the thing that yeah. you want, right? Yeah. And I think that you just have to be really honest with yourself yeah. about that. Like PMP was great. Everyone was like, you're crazy. You should not shut that down. You can probably just fix it. You can probably just change some stuff. Yeah. And I was like, I'm... I loved it and it was sad. I cried my eyes out, of course. And I had to let people go. And people I loved, like these team members were with me for years and I let them go and they had nowhere else to go and I couldn't save them, you know? And it was awful, but you have to do what is right for you, like in this lifetime, you know? Because like good is good, but great is what we deserve. Yes. Yeah. And so then you and Tim start. We start. Full rebrand, new, you close down your podcast, everything. Like it wasn't. Oh my God. So I had the Steph Gordon show. Yes. That was the hardest. I can imagine. That was the hardest to give up. Mm-hmm. He was like, let's do a podcast together. I think we should just get rid of yours and do it. And I was just like, I had like a physical yes. recoil. Like I was like, I don't want to do this. Like this is everything I built. I felt like he was taking it from me. Mm. And oh God, so much ego wrapped in that. Yeah. Like I I really didn't realize how egotistical I was until. <laughs> until, so until I started business with my husband. <laughs> yeah, because I realized that it was all about me. Yeah. And I'd made it that way because it's a personal brand. Yes. If someone came in tomorrow and started, you know, being in your brand, you'd be like, hold on. When people ask to collaborate, I'm like, I don't do collaboration. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, I've been burned by all my business partners. This is a Beck Antonucci show. And you just have to like, and so it was a, a real like realising that, oh God, it was, just, I really had to make space for someone else yes. to also be a genius. And that was just really unusual when you build up an entire personal brand. Yeah. It's really hard to just let someone else come in and be a genius, even if you love them. Yeah. Uh, and so, yes, yeah, so we, we shut down the podcast. We, oh my gosh, it was just a whole wild thing. And we had a lot of uncomfortable conversations where Tim was like, it's like, you don't want me to be here, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and part of me was like, I don't. Yeah. And but there was another part of me that was like, I can see our future needs this. And I can see that our clients will benefit from having Tim um, in their world. And I know that I will benefit from having Tim yeah. in this world. And so I was like, I just have to, I just have to like get over myself and create space for both of us. So how was every hurdle that you're navigating in business as a couple impacting your relationship as a couple? Because I'm mm. assuming your relationship as business partners is different to your relationship as husband and wife. Can you tell us a little bit about that? This has been a really big thing for us because when we were working together, like we work together all the time, obviously. And so we work all day together. We, we have separate offices, but we're working in the same house. So yeah. we see each other all the time. And he works on his tasks and I work on mine. And that's kind of how it, it runs. But for Tim and I, the thing that was most difficult was at the end of the day, me stepping into a feminine energy, I just didn't know how to turn it off. Yeah. Because I'd be stressed about work or whatever. And I read a book actually. And this book is... I haven't really spoken about this publicly because I've actually been a little honestly worried about some kickback that I might get, but I've shared it with a few friends and they've loved it. And I think for anybody who's struggling, I think if you're in a relationship, it's the perfect time to read it. I think maybe if you're single, wait till you're in a relationship and then read it. But there's a book and it's called The Surrendered Wife, which triggered me Mm -hmm. just in its title Mm -hmm. (laughs) because (laughs) I was like, what is like... I like don't need to be a surrendered wife. Yeah. But the whole concept, and I know we've spoken about this private, like the whole concept is that if you just trust your husband to lead, mm-hmm. you actually can just kick your feet up. And I think so much of what we're seeing in society is women mm-hmm. who are trying to control everything. They control how their kids get fed. They control how the dishwasher gets stacked. They control, you know, their husband is driving and they're, <gasps> and they're jumping at the, you know, in the mm-hmm. car. And it all comes back to a lack of trust. Mm-hmm. Really is what it comes back to is a lack of trust. And thinking that your way is better than his way. Mm-hmm. And The Surrendered Wife, the book really took me through the process of realizing that I make mistakes Mm -hmm. and he allows me to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. But when he makes mistakes, I'm not as forgiving because I'm right. And so there's this concept that we've been really working through where I'm like, if he's making a decision, I just just have fully kicked back. I'm like, you make all the decisions in business. And if it goes sideways and it fucks up and it is awful, Mm -hmm. that's how we learn. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way that he can learn. I can't expect him to figure it out perfectly every single time because mm-hmm. I didn't figure it out perfectly every single time and I had grace yeah. for me. So why wouldn't I give him the same grace? Mm-hmm. And so since that change, so since making that decision to fully trust Tim and just let him take the lead and just me kick my feet up, um, we actually did a, I don't know, am I allowed to talk about drugs? You can talk about anything on this show. We went to 
Bali over New Year's and a friend of ours, a mutual friend of ours actually hooked us up. So we did some mushrooms. Yes. And it was like, we thought that we were just going to have a good time, but what we actually got was therapy. <laughs> via the mushroom <laughs> and he was basically like I just want you to be happy I really want you to be happy and you don't seem happy mm. and I was like I wasn't happy because I felt like I was controlling everything and I was really exhausted yeah. and he was like I just want you to be happy and in that moment I was like I need to work less I need you to do more stuff and he was like I want to do more stuff mm -hmm. and I was like oh I felt like I was plaguing him with more work but he was dying to take over mm -hmm. so we had this therapy with the mushrooms and the next morning we woke up and and since it was new year's this year just gone ever since then it's been really easy mm -hmm. it's been super helpful and can i share as an outsider mm. i feel like tim has just expanded and expanded and expanded and expanded and they say an amazing woman makes a man 10 times the man yeah and so you know i don't i don't feel people respond to having their wings clipped and i don't think we as women intentionally mean I to clip mean to. men's wings we're constantly looking for safety like oh you fucked it up like am i safe i built a seven-figure business if you make all the decisions am i safe i've come from huge wounding around money am i safe mm. but when we're like picking and chopping that man is just not gonna soar no. so as soon as you've surrendered to his choices that he makes for the both of you and saying on the other side of the, whatever happens we'll then problem solve that mm. if that's what arises and we'll learn from it I just feel like he's just expanding. He has. He loves it. And he just feels so... He I looks tell him, like he loves it. Yeah. And I tell him every day, I'm like, you are so smart and you are so handsome mm -hmm. and you are so incredible and thank you for everything you do for us. And I just, that's like my mantra, like just every yeah. day, like I'm just so grateful. And he just gets so like yeah. lit up by it, you know, because yeah. all he wants is for me to be happy. Yeah. All he wants is for me to adore him. Of yeah. course. All I want is for him to adore me. Yeah. And he adores me more when I'm wearing my dressing gown, you know, like yeah. satin, sexy, cute. <laughs> um, you know, and so I think it's like really allowing that dynamic. So for any woman listening right now that is like, okay, I do want to put down the sword. Maybe she's in relationship or knows that when she's with a man, she's just looking for every fault to mm. see whether he can actually stay around for the long term. I feel to begin with, putting down the sword is challenging. I'm sure when you're letting him make decisions, well, or not letting him, but choosing to say you're the decision maker mm. and maybe they're not the decisions that you would have gone with, how would you support that woman or encourage her, invite her into supporting herself as he's taking the lead? Yeah, I think it comes down to, like, and I, I know I've said it before, but it really comes down to trust. And I yes. think trust in two ways. Trust in that if you have trust, you have nothing. Yeah. So if you're in any kind of relationship, whether that's a friendship, whether that's anything, like you have to go in with trust. And as soon as it's broken, sure, get the fuck out. Yeah. For sure. Like, absolutely. But if you don't have trust, you really don't have anything. Yeah. And so for us, it was, for me, it's like one is, you know, you have to go in with trust and just let them be human and let them make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is self-trust. Trust yourself that yes. regardless of what happens, you will always have you and yeah. you'll always be okay. And it's easier said than done. I think the self-trust piece is actually the reason why so many women don't trust men. Yes. Because you don't trust just Like if your heart is broken, you will heal. Yeah. Because you've done it many times before. And you know how to do it. And yeah. as long as you always have you to come home to, you are safe. Mm -hmm. And so if that is always the constant, mm -hmm. then there's no reason to not trust the other person. But mm -hmm. I think so many women are detached from yeah. self-trust. And they're so detached that he's going to hurt me. It's like, yeah. well, no, like, yes, he may, but also you will be okay. And yeah. I think as long as like that lives there, that's really the relationship I think most women need to work on. And I also feel from listening to this conversation, the third piece that you say that you and Tim do frequently is the hard conversations Talk. because people can make mistakes and you can repair after any rupture if you're having the hard mm -hmm. conversations. But if you're not having them and Tim does something, you're like, oh, I'll bring it up. And then you do something, he's like, well, don't bring it up. All of a sudden, we've got this ru beautiful rug because you took such beautiful people with a beautiful brand. But underneath it, we've got resent a pile of resentment that hasn't been cleared. And you can't trust someone on top of a pile of resentment. Totally. And I think the conversations, like if, if there's even a slight energy shift, mm -hmm. we're like, what's up? Mm -hmm. Tell me what's up. Mm -hmm. And... We're just really big on calling that straight yeah. away, which is why we're having, we have a lot of hard conversations. And I think, you know, it's hard to build a million dollar business. We're currently on trajectory for 2.5 this year. And then yes. um, in the next two years, we'd like to hit five, right? Yes. And every level of that requires a different version of you. Yeah. Every level of that requires, because, you know, the, the more clients you have, the more shit you take, the more, <laughs> like, the, you know, the more stuff comes yeah. at you, the more you post online, the more hate you get. Yeah. The, like, there's, 
you're constantly healing at every new level yeah. money beliefs beliefs about what's possible beliefs about what personalization looks like belief about you know trusting people to come into your programs yeah. whatever it is right and so i think that at every level there's a you know a new version of us and we are going through an extreme expansion at the moment mm-hmm. personally energetically and on a business level mm-hmm. and we have to be having those hard conversations like on an almost daily basis. Yeah. It's like, okay, well, why do you not agree with this? Okay, yes. well, let's just – and we're not arguing by any means. Yeah. We're just saying like, okay, well, I want to see it from your perspective, so just tell me how you feel. Tell yeah. me what's going on right now. Tell me what's happening yeah. so I can understand it. But we've also done mountains of self-development. Yeah. Mountains. Yeah. So I know you said the more uh, more clients you have, the more shit you take. The more you're online, the more shit you take, the more hate you get. So talk to me about that because I've started talking about money online Ooh, recently. Yes. And you knew that I didn't even think I had any edges, but I'm like, uh, that Some was edge. a bit of like it, it's it's an it's been an edge for me. Yeah. Big time. So talk to me about number one, speaking about money so frequently online and the expectations that come with that from clients. Yeah. So we I mean, I went through a season the last probably two years where I predominantly spoke about money. And I predominantly spoke about it for two reasons. One, I love money. Yeah. <laughs> and like I really do. I love What it do you love about it? I just love people say money can't buy you happiness, but damn, like it can get you pretty close to be honest. I like my three story villa in Bali, I'm not gonna lie. Correct. <laughs> I think no, it can't buy you happiness because happiness is an internal thing. Yeah. Right. But it can bring you a hell of a lot closer to yeah. designing a life that makes you happy more often. Yes. And so I think one, like I, I love money because and I also just think that life we have such a short period of time here mm-hmm. on this earth. Like mm-hmm. eighty years if we're lucky. Mm-hmm. Why wouldn't you have the full buffet? Like, mm. why wouldn't you do everything? I want, like, I want to try some private jets. Like, I might only do that once, but I want to know what it's like. Like, mm. we have this incredible opportunity where there are people who get all of it. Why can't I have yeah. a taste of all of it? It's not because I'm greedy or because I just want to experience the full. I have incredible husband. I have so much love. I have incredible friends. I've got mm. beautiful clients. Like, my life is full. That doesn't mean that I can't desire for, mm. like, the most wild existence that I can imagine. Yes. And so I do want to live that wild existence. We want to move. We want to move. We want to, like, try new things. We want to try new things. We mm-hmm. want to, you know, grow our business or, you know, eat at the best restaurant in the world. Like, I want to go and do those things. Yeah. And so money allows for that. But the, the reason I mostly love speaking about money is because I had such a poor relationship with money mm. for most of my life because mm. um, my dad went bankrupt, like I said before, when I was seven. So really in those formative years when you build a lot of belief system about yourself. Yeah. Um, when my dad went bankrupt, my parents also separated. So um, we lost everything. Yes. My parents separated. I also lost a parent in that like mm. period of time because I wasn't seeing my dad anymore. Um, and he had a stroke. So we had this really extreme thing happen mm. in one day. For me, it felt like one day. And when you like come out of something like that and you have to heal your relationship with money, for me personally, the work to have to do that was just so powerful. And I just wish that everybody had the experience of not being scared of money and not mm. hating it. Um, and so the reason I talk about money was mostly to normalize it. Yes. I want to normalize it because everyone earns it. Mm-hmm. Everyone has to have it. Everyone has to spend it. Cost mm-hmm. of living's going up. Like, and if you want more of it, you have to behave differently. Mm-hmm. And so, I just wanted to talk more about it so people could just stop being so personally attached to it mm-hmm. and just start seeing it for what it is. Like, it's just like this laptop that's sitting in front of you. Mm-hmm. It's just like this glass of water. It's just a thing. Mm-hmm. So, why are we so personal about it? Yeah. Why? Why do you feel, Steph? It's so stigmatized. It's so taboo. There's so many opinions about it. There's so much fear to talk about it. There's so much fear to. For me, I was like, I don't want to tell people. Because I don't want to make people feel bad about whatever they're doing. I had this whole edge. I'm like, bitch, you talk about herpes on the internet. Like, mate, <laughs> yeah, they're like, you swear all the time. I'm like, no, but like this piece was a really big thing for me. So why do you think that is? Why is it so taboo, money? We all need it. We all literally like no one gets to live without it ever, anywhere in the world. Mm-hmm. And so it's wild that mm-hmm. we don't talk about it or that it's there's still stigma. I mean, why is there stigma around sex though? I guess it's mm-hmm. the same thing we all have it, right? So but I think the stigma with money is Australia is especially terrible for it. Yes. I think you talk about money all day in America and no one will care. Yeah. I really do. I really believe that. I don't think they care. They love money. They mm-hmm. love talking about money. They're happy to go for money. If they don't have money, they know it's because they haven't worked hard. Like they're very clear 
in the US. Oh yeah, that. my Uber drivers in Austin, they had like four jobs, they're hustling in the in-between. They're like, Correct. what do you do, girlfriend? And they're like, that's so awesome. Yeah. And I do this as a side gig. Yeah, they're hustling. Yeah, they hustle, man. Like yeah. if they want more money, they know they just have to work for it. Yeah. It's very much the case in America. Like they're yeah. very taught that in Australia, I really believe, and this is like pretty, a little bit conspiracy, but like I really Good. just believe our government doesn't want us to be wealthy. Yeah. I, I, we have tall poppy syndrome. You know, the minute that someone gets a little bit famous or a little bit of attention in Australia, like everyone comes to try and take mm -hmm. them down a notch. You know, you're big noting yourself, like mm -hmm. all this sort of stuff. And so I really believe that the Australian government, you know, they don't want a bunch of entrepreneurs. They mm -hmm. don't want a heap of free thinkers. They don't want people who are challenging societal norms. They need people to fund and to work and to, yes. you know, live in their existence. Yeah. And so they don't want too many people breaking outside of that. Yeah. You know, that's why we get taxed really heavily in business. It's like a lot of additional stuff. Like... They don't want us to do it because if you're watching what's happening in America right now, you can't control people when mm -hmm. they're free thinkers. It's yeah. very hard to control a, a country like that. Yeah. And so I don't believe that we're designed by birth to have a lot of money. We're not designed to understand money. We don't go through education systems learning about mm -hmm. it. There's no right to earn. There's mm -hmm. no, you know, think big and dream big and the American dream. We mm -hmm. don't have that here. It's very much like the Australian dream is very much like you go to school and then you go to university mm -hmm. and then you get married and then you stop working and you have children and then that's it. I just much. can't, I mean, I was very good at school. I was a high achiever, but I can't believe I learned Pythagoras theorem. Algebra <laughs> was not talk about, taught about tax, was not taught about savings. I've always hustled from age 15 to nine months when you can get a job in mm -hmm. Australia. It's wild that I wasn't set up for a crazy amount of success by the time I was 30. I was in a huge amount of personal debt by 31. Mm -hmm. But if I had been taught differently, mm -hmm. That didn't actually need to be the case. And it blows my mind that I wasn't taught differently. Yeah. And I can't agree more. I just think this country is not designed for it. Yeah. And so if you're listening to this and you're Australian, it's okay if you're bad with money. It's okay if you have yeah. shame and stigma around money. You have not been designed yeah. to be different to that. But the best thing I can encourage anyone that's listening to do is just to like start listening to and finding ways to understand money because yeah. it really is so easy to make. Yes once you understand, like once you understand the basics. Where would you direct that woman to go? To what particular resource or a book or a podcast? Just where would you tell her to start? Because that's where I think feel a lot of women are confused. Where do I begin? I would just start with like, I think the She's on the Money podcast is really good, okay. to be honest. I think they do a really good job of like just destigmatizing money yes. and destigmatizing debt and destigmatizing like people's mistakes with money. Like we make mistakes all the time, right? Yeah. Like people drop their kids on their heads. Like that happens, like by accident. Like they'll just be like, mothers tell me all the time like I was putting my kid in the car and I smacked his head on the door or I slept you know that yeah. shit happens we don't walk around with heaps of shame about it yeah so why is it that when we make a mistake with money we immediately like oh I have I have to feel you know I made a bad investment I made yeah. a bad debt like we were talking about coaches before yes you know you make a bad investment in coaching or you make a bad investment with money and you're reluctant to make that Yes. Same mistake again, but you will do it in so many other areas of yes. life and in so many other arenas, but you won't do it with money. It's like you'll trip up the stairs, but you won't ever stop walking upstairs. Totally. You skip a step walking down and you know that moment where your heart yeah. jumps out of your chest, but you won't stop yeah. walking downstairs. You'll just be like, okay, next time I'm going to look. Totally. Or like in a relationship. Yeah. You fuck it up and then you go again and yeah. you're on dating apps and here we are yeah. and we go again and we go again and we go again. And it's like learning to walk. We go again and we go again. But with money... We make a mistake and then we just like create so much shame. Yes. So much like fear and, and doubt. And immediately the minute you posted about money, you lost followers. Yeah. And so there's the in instant reinforcement of if I'm too much, if yeah. I earn too much, if I have too much, people will hate me for yeah. it. Yeah. And they do. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. It's wild. The post went up and like the reach went crazy and the followers went down. And I was like, that's, I can't create a story about that, but. It's interesting that that was there. It's their story. Yeah. Mm. So my question for you is, as a business coach that speaks about money online, has for a really long time, I'm curious what kind of client expectations that comes with and do you believe that the expectations a client comes with can often be unjust, unfair, unrealistic? Mm. I'm going to answer this with a story because I think yeah. it's super relevant. A couple of months ago now, I had a woman who was interested in joining the program. Obviously, we speak about money all the time. Not mm -hmm. only do we speak about our own money, we speak about our clients' money. We mm -hmm. talk about the $50,000 a month, the $100,000 a month, the, this profit margin, they made this much money this quarter. Um, you know, One of our clients recently just went from $0 to 
a million dollar business in 12 months, right? So we talk about that stuff online. Wow, what kind of business does she have? VA agency. Beautiful. Agency. Actually, all of the ones so far that have done it have been agency based, which is wow. really interesting. So done for you levels. Yeah. Although a couple of coaches on their way up, which is really exciting. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to put in, when I first started with Steph and I told her the results that I was wanting, Steph did say to me, I'd love for you to dedicate a minimum of six months to this before you see any kind of result for everything that we're implementing because I'd been burned by the industry you're like you don't have to stay doing this but I say forecast six months as the bare minimum and I love that yeah absolutely so this woman came to me the other week and she said Steph I really need to go all in on this business yes and I'm not making enough money but if I don't make this work I'm gonna have to go back to work in three months yes and she goes so if I join success school can you guarantee me that in three months I will make enough so that I won't have to go back to work Mm. And I voice dropped her and I was like, if anybody makes you that promise, they are lying. Mm -hmm. Because no one can make that promise for you unless they're actually doing the work for you. So unless someone's actually going to come in and do the work for your business, they can't guarantee the result because I can't guarantee whether you're going to take action. I don't know what mindset blocks are going to come up. I don't know what skills you Mm -hmm. have. I don't know how big your audience is, how warm it is, how receptive it is. Mm -hmm. I was like, at the end of the day, you putting this three month pressure on your business is Mm -hmm. actually going to strangle it. And it's actually going to suffocate it from growth. Mm -hmm. Because when we are desperate and we need something to happen, we oftentimes, especially with money, will slip into like an overwhelm or a fear-based reaction, which usually makes us overthink. Once we get into a fear-based reaction, you know, our logical mind turns off. We're now rushing with emotion. We're rushing with adrenaline. We're no Mm -hmm. longer thinking clearly. You can't grow a business like that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. So I just said to her, I was like, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I can promise you that in the next three months. But Mm -hmm. what I can say is go back to work, relieve the financial pressure, go back part-time and then let's spend the next six to 12 months mm-hmm. building this thing up so that you only have to stay at work for six months. Mm-hmm. And that's all we have to do. I just think that too many people are boasting about shit on like, what, so mm-hmm. the answer to your question is I'm real. Yes. I'm really real about it. Like, yes, you can. There is potential for you to get mm-hmm. zero to you know, $85,000 a month in 12 months. There is potential. I've seen it happen. I've done it. I've had multiple clients do it now. There is potential, but I think that if you go in and you expect that Mm -hmm. without necessarily wanting to do the work or wanting to implement, like it really comes down to you and like Mm -hmm. how much you're willing to put in. And so like when I first started working with you, I was like, girl, we have to get so much system stuff done Mm -hmm. because like right now you just don't have the foundation for the scalability Mm -hmm. that you require. Mm -hmm. And all we would do, like if we just turned the marketing tap on and we just poured leads into your business and we poured sales into your business Mm -hmm. at that time, you just wouldn't have been able to handle it. You would have been working 95 hour weeks and then you would just quit Mm because you would have been like, fuck this, I don't want to do it. And I signed up to an out of integrity coach before. I was like, he promised me the leads, but Mm -hmm. I knew, I was like, I don't think I have the infrastructure. And he sold to my ego and I was like, let's go. It obviously didn't work. And then afterwards, you know, when maturity stepped in, I was thinking if everything that he had promised had of actually worked because he made promises you've never made a promise you're like i'm committed and we're, this is what we're going to do all in with you if you're in i'm in but i can't do the work for you he made promises and that really spoke to a young coach version of me and my huge massive ego and then the, the mature part of me is like if his promises had have been true i did not have the infrastructure to hold any of that i would have collapsed in a day yeah it was you yeah it was just you there yes. was no one else to support you. You yeah. didn't have systems. You, I remember at the time you were still like <laughs> manually sending like I was individual emails. Links. People, I'm like, yeah. People were like, I want to book a call, and you were like going and creating a link and then sending it to people. I was like, literally googling like, what time is it in New York City right now to do the time convert? Like, yeah, it's crazy. like you just couldn't have handled. You couldn't have handled it. We we had to get infrastructure set up first. So like. Yeah, for anybody who's out there right now and they're looking at coaches online, yeah. you know, just be really cautious. Like if they're promising you the world, like, yeah. you know, it's very rare. Yeah. A coach with integrity will be real with you. Yeah. And they'll tell you honestly. You and I both know that like 90% of the time it's not going to be the case. Like if yeah. someone makes you a big promise, it's probably not going to be able to deliver on it. Like, yeah. And have you seen clients come into your world who wanted big things and that just wasn't their journey for the first six months, for the first 12 months? 18 months, 24, and then in the third year, they're like, everything that I have worked for is landing now. Have you seen that? Yeah, multiple times. Um, and sometimes it's just, it's hard, It's really hard. It's yeah. super hard to watch sometimes, yeah. yeah. How do you encourage someone to stay in the game when, 
you know, they're working towards it and they can see all their peers. It looks like on Instagram right now, everyone's making a million dollars in 2.5 seconds from one Instagram viral reel. For the coach that is, or the entrepreneur, service-based entrepreneur that is showing up and she believes her heart is so infused in this business and things just aren't clicking. What would you say to her to keep her in the game rather than tapping out? Uh, just like all that shit you're seeing online is fake. I just, <laughs> I just can't. Like I, I've now coached over uh, like 1,400 people, 1,400 yeah. businesses I've seen the back end yeah. of. I'm also in masterminds where there's 300 other business coaches and I'm seeing the back ends of seven figure, eight figure, like million dollar week businesses. Yes. And I'm telling you, there's no easy, quick hack. Like none of them have yeah. done it quick and easy. Even if they had a quick rise to success, they've had a really big drop afterwards. Like mm -hmm. no one has managed to just have viral reels, make heaps of money and stay there forever. Mm -hmm. like, because at the end of the day, if you just had a viral reel and you made the money, you don't actually have the skills yeah. to actually hold that for long because you haven't got the infrastructure. Like yeah. it just, it doesn't work that way. So whatever you're seeing online, it's not true. Every single person I know that's made seven figures has worked for years mm. to get there, years. So even though I did it in 12 months, I did it in 12 months because I had two businesses before that that I learned from mm -hmm. so that I could learn all of the lessons to be able to implement zero to like seven figures in 12 months, you yes. know? So I think that there's that. The second thing I would say is this becomes the story. Mm -hmm. There is no one that you would, you know, Tony Robbins, Preston, mm. um, you know, you, like you, you have felt active wherever. Yeah, so like, many times. <laughs> just like. I come back to Perth and I just pray to God for someone to help me because I'd had no money left and I'd put everything into this active wear and kind of hope for the best. Totally, <laughs> babe. And so there's this thing where it's like. Every single person that you look up to has a story of how many times they failed before they got it right. Yeah. This is your story. Yeah. And so you can't skip this part because you want the thing. Mm -hmm. You want the seven-figure business and you want the PR and you want to be in Forbes and you want mm -hmm. to be picked up by Spotify and you yeah. want all these things. But you can't have it without the struggle. The struggle yeah. is what made it worth having in the first place. Yeah. And so, you know, we have one client who really, she took all of our advice, but she just hadn't fully developed the magnetism. Yes. It was an internal thing. It wasn't the strategy. It wasn't the stuff. It wasn't mm -hmm. the thing. She wasn't yet ready to receive. Yes. And it took years for that to unlock for her. Yeah. And it wasn't much that we could do. Like, well, she was making money, but she wasn't making the money she wanted yeah. to make. And uh, she got jobs. She got part-time jobs, you know, selling stuff. It took time mm -hmm. for that to happen. And when it happened... You should sort of see her face. Like it's just because that now becomes her story, mm. you know, and she gets to be one of those few that actually cracked it and who suffered. So if you're suffering, if you're in the pain, if you're in the depth, like this is the story. And every day you get to choose, like, how do I want this story to end? Like, does she quit and give up or does yeah. she just like plow through and keep going and like finally get where she wanted to go? I love that so much. It reminds me of a conversation I was having with one of my clients this week because she knows everything. She's smart. She's beautiful. She's done all the courses and she came to me for business coaching. But we've had some things that she's had to break through. And I said to her, embodiment is actually what creates the magnetism totally. that you spoke about. Because I can talk about freedom. I could have still been in my Perth office the past two years telling people about what it's like mm. to live freely. Or I could leave my ex-boyfriend and move to Bali and actually embody what a freedom lifestyle actually looks and feels like, what pleasure truly feels like. I don't tell people I'm experiencing pleasure right now. They see it and they say, I don't know what it is, but I want it. She's been doing such courageous things behind the scenes, mm -hmm. disclosing to men for the first time, having crazy wild sex after coming from so much church trauma. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, can I offer you a reflection? And she said, yeah. I said, I never would sign up to you prior to going through this because you're talking to me about moving through shame, but you haven't moved through your own. You can know all the things, but if you're not embodying it, that's not authenticity. That's not a coach I'm paying for. And you can feel it. Yeah. Broke money coaches, like, and there's no judgment. Like, I get it, girl. You're doing your thing. You're out there. You're trying to help people. But, like, so much of it is like, has to come from here. Yes. And, like, you have to go through it. Like, I'm, an, I'm only an incredible coach because I failed so many times, yes. you know, because I've, like, literally I could see what's ahead for you yeah. because I've been there and I've fucked it up yeah. so many times. And I'm like, Beck, if you don't do it this way, like, if you don't keep building this audience, if you don't be in a season I had a you. team member that I had an uncomfortable ending with and Steph was supporting me, telling me what to do as it was happening. And I was like, I did basically the opposite of what you said. And, and at the, on the other side of it, I was like, if I just listened to what Steph said to begin with, 
she was right. <laughs> she already knew. <laughs> already knew because I've been there. already knew. been there. And that's like, that's the coach you want to work with. Yeah. I would want to work with you because you did it yeah. and you lived it and you did it so courageously and you spoke yeah. about it so like raw and you speak about it so honestly. And this season of your life has been your best. Yes. For business. Yes. And in all other ways. Business and, and all, pleasure, and all baby. pleasure. <laughs> and so for me, witnessing you, it's like you were talking about personal freedom but then your business exploded when you lived personal freedom. Yes. And I think that for the coach that maybe is listening to this, it might just be a case of where am I holding myself back from like full embodiment of the yeah. thing that I teach? And so talk to me, what are your thoughts, Steph, on the coach that speaks about money online and maybe he, she has created financial results for themselves, mm. but is not creating financial results for the client because I'm having client after client, Instagram follower, DM, podcast listener, women reflect back to me. I signed up to this coach, no results. Yeah. And she was talking big numbers, a big game on the internet. And I'm like, creating it for yourself and then creating that result for 100 clients are two very different things. Totally. I think the biggest thing for me is you need to really do your research these days. Because yeah. marketing and copy, like people are really good at that yeah. now. <laughs> like people are so good at marketing. And that's, yeah. and you know, you can hire people to do that. Yeah. So even more dangerous is yeah. that you don't even have to live it because someone else can just write good shit for yes. them. And so you can no longer just rely on marketing. Yeah. You know, the coaching industry is blown up. It's, it has been up until recently, been quite easy to make money. Mm-hmm. Um, and so people have, you know, flooded to the industry, of course, and it's unregulated. It's all sorts of stuff that's wrong with the industry, mm-hmm. obviously. The best thing you can do if you're thinking about investing with a coach is really like ask a heap of questions because I think it's like really comes down to that like cool so you've Mm -hmm. done it for yourself can you prove to me and I want to know like that you can do it for your clients I want to see proof so like we send people to our clients to Mm -hmm. talk to them we're super lucky that our clients are so chill with that but we actually will be like hey you're thinking about signing up go and speak to these people first and make sure that that's a real thing. If they're Mm -hmm. claiming somebody's advice or or somebody's numbers online, go and find out that company Mm -hmm. and actually message them. Be like, hey, I almost signed up with a PR company and I was going to spend like $10,000 a month for this PR. Yeah. And they had one testimonial on their like slide deck and I remember the chick's name and I messaged her on Insta and I was like, hey, I'm thinking about signing up for this PR agency. They said that they got you into Forbes and they did all this stuff. Like, tell me how that worked. How did you find it? She was like, I never worked with them. (gasps) <gasps> wow what and she was on their slide deck on their slide deck a photo and her name oh my god she was like yeah i like i I'd, I'd had a conversation with them previously and they'd given me some advice but i never paid them never worked with them they didn't get me any of the stuff i went and got all my own features yeah. and i was like this is what's wrong with the industry right now mm. so i think if you're a coach and you're talking about money online yeah cool talk about your money but actually it's kind of it's not ick I don't want to say it's it because I don't think it is because I still talk about money, you talk about money and I think it's really important to normalise those conversations. What I think we need to change is I think we also need to talk about the kinds of money that our clients are making and Mm -hmm. not just revenue but also profit Mm -hmm. because it's all well and good to make you don't do this because you have an incredible business but like a lot of people I've seen make seven figures and they take home next to nothing. Do you know Preston and Alexi were one of the first people to say that to me you know a few years ago I was like I want to make my first seven figures and they were like Beck, we know a lot of seven figure entrepreneurs that take home Less than eighty thousand dollars, and I was like, "How the fuck do you make How? seven figures and take home eighty grand?" Yeah, because it's all like, look, it depends on the industry, it depends on the business, but a lot of it is, you know, they're spending so much on marketing mm-hmm. to get the people through the door, mm-hmm. right? Because it's probably not that embodied, and mm-hmm. so, yeah, profitability is huge. Like, it's a huge thing. If you're a coach on the internet right now, talk about your money for sure, but please mm-hmm. start like talking about your clients' results. It's going to mm-hmm. get you so many more clients through the door because they're going to see themselves in someone else's story as well. And I've spoken about this a lot and I love the concept of it. You've obviously said do your due diligence and I say that all the time. I mean, Carrie Azuma, my nervous system mentor, she wasn't a cheap investment for me and USD conversion to AUD is not, <laughs> not, not in our favour. <laughs> And when I went to sign up to her, I was like, I don't know. And it's a huge investment. I've done so much personal development. Is this just going to be another course that I've done? And she said to me, here are a few names of my clients. If you feel like you would like to connect with them, send them a message. I'm sure they'd love to send you a voice memo. And they all sent me two to six minute voice memos back speaking and singing her praises. And I would do the same because I would love people to sign up with Carrie as same some of your clients have messaged me and asked what their experience is. I do that now when people are like, well, how can you guarantee me results? I say, no, if I could guarantee anyone's results, I'd have a multi seven figure business right now. <laughs> and I'd have an amazing husband with amazing dick. <laughs> I'd, be doing all th- I'd have I'd sex be on a- this table and Steph would not be here. Yeah, we better you on the south of France, honey. Yeah. I'd be busy. <laughs> 
But I send them my clients' handles. I'm like, just send them a message and ask about the, like, do your due diligence, you empower yourself. You have to do so much digging now. Yeah. Yes. What would you say to someone that, you know, like I came to you after I'd been burned and I was nervous. I was fearful to invest. Same as my podcast team. You know, I was a hard work client. I say all the time, I'm going to be their problem child turned golden child because I'd just been burned so hard. I lacked trust if I'm going to invest these big dollars into these people. Is this going to be another person that's going to fuck me around essentially? Mm. Beyond due diligence, what would you say to the person that's like, I've done the due diligence. Okay, Beck says Steph's awesome. I love Beck. I've listened to every episode. She says Carrie's amazing, but I'm just scared to lean in. What would you say to that person? I literally had this conversation with with a client this week. She reached out to a potential client. She reached out to all of our clients. She had multiple sales calls. She had more questions. She wanted yeah. to see the back end. She wanted, I was like proud of her. I was proud of her. Yeah. I'm more than happy to facilitate that. And she still was. She still decided it was a no yeah. in, in that moment. And she said, "I'm just too scared." And I, I said, "That's fine. Absolutely, take your time. And you can't push. Like it needs to feel like a yes, right?" But I just said to her, "At some point, you're going to have to trust again. Mm-hmm. At some point, you're going to have to trust yourself again. At mm-hmm. some point, you're going to have to trust in somebody else again." Because like the analogy I use is like Warren Buffett. He's a very rich man. He's a very rich man because he made really good investments, but he didn't only make good investments. Mm -hmm. He also made a lot of bad investments, Mm. which helped him to figure out which the next investments, which ones were right. Mm -hmm. You cannot only have good experiences. Mm. That is not how the world works. There Mm. have to be bad experiences. You have to lose money. I have made shitty investments with coaches. I've made shitty investments with business. I've made shitty investments with my time and energy with friends. Mm -hmm. I have made shitty decisions with boyfriends Mm -hmm. (laughs) and dates, even though I knew I still made bad decisions. At some point, you have to go again. Yeah. And so you just have to, like, fear is not, yeah, go do some inner work. Like, go, you know, figure out what that fear is and how you can, you know, potentially make the leap. But at the end of the day, like, you have to move. Like, mm-hmm. you're not going to do it on your own. Yeah. You're not. And you, I haven't done it on my own. I don't know one single entrepreneur that's a multi-seven-figure yeah. entrepreneur that's done it on their own. No one has done it on their own. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you have to learn. And, yeah, you got burnt. But getting burnt allowed you to ask better questions so mm-hmm. that next time you wouldn't get burnt again. Yeah. Just learn. And I've built a business, whether it's me supporting others or others supporting me, on my value for relationship because that's my personal value now. Mm -hmm. I won't just invest because I think that person can grow me somewhere because relationship is more important to me. Yeah. And that feels really good. Yeah, absolutely. My final question for you, Steph, is in this Instagram age, Mm. I feel like so many people want to be an entrepreneur, but not everyone is built Mm. to be an entrepreneur. How would someone know if they're built to be an entrepreneur or not? Oh, I think that the thing that separates real entrepreneurs mm-hmm. from more entrepreneurs, mm-hmm. probably, um, and lovingly, it's fine if you're not. There's also a thing called intrapreneur, which is where you can grow really heavily in someone else's business. It's mm-hmm. so like most of the people who work for us are intrapreneurs. They have bonuses that they can aspire to. They want to earn more money. They want the opportunity to earn more money. They want opportunity for progression, but they don't want to take the risk mm-hmm. of having their own business. Yes. The different is risk, your risk tolerance, your risk mm-hmm. appetite. Um, Beck, how many credit cards and failed businesses have you had prior to this? A lot. <laughs> yes, many. Because you have a high risk appetite. Yes. You're not scared of taking a risk. You're not scared of throwing ten thousand dollars. I mean, look at Alex Hormozy or any of these people. Like, yeah. like you know, he had all his clients steal from him hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm-hmm. And in that moment, when he was living in his like basement floor with his girlfriend, mm-hmm. he was like, "That's it. I've got fifty thousand dollars of credit cards here. So I guess I've just got to put it all on that and go all in." On. Mm-hmm. So he went to zero and then went further behind zero to make it work. Fall down seven, stand up eight, baby. We do that. Real yeah. entrepreneurs they have a risk appetite. Mm -hmm. You have to be okay with losing it all. Like Mm -hmm. I was, uh, you know, I talk a lot about my parents going bankrupt. One good thing from that for me was we did lose it all and we survived. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's like, well, I mean, I know what it's like to be broke. So like if we go to zero, that's cool. I also trust myself enough and know I have the skills now that I could build anything pretty quickly. But I'm not scared of zero. I'm not scared of below zero because I know that we can make it back. And so it's risk. It's your, your ability to risk, your ability to go like, fuck it, I'm going to take the leap. I'm going to quit my job. People who won't even quit their jobs, that's really where you know because it's scary. And it's not just the quitting of the job because it's not actually financial because it doesn't make sense because you just go get another job Mm -hmm. tomorrow. So it's never a financial jump. It's the person jump. You're jumping from safety into the unknown. Mm -hmm. And it's that will oftentimes be the key point for an entrepreneur. Like it's like how do you handle it, when there's risk on the line, when there's fear on the line, when there's doubt on the line, are you all in or are you just terrified? Mm. And I think like for you and me, if like if you were going to zero tomorrow, Beck, you would be like, let's 
freaking go. I'm like, like you would I can't step unlearn up. what I've learned. Like, totally. I would fucking hate it, but I'm like, I will know exactly what to do. Totally. And you would just go all in. Yeah. Like, it's not, there would be, no, like, yeah, you'd have fear and you'd have disappointment and you'd have feelings, of course. Mm. But you would just be like, all right, time mm. to turn up. Like, let's go, you mm. know? And I think that that's the difference. I think some people are like the thought of going to zero just paralyzes them into fear. And I think unless you're willing to move past that, mm -hmm. it's going to be really hard for you to have a business. And for the person listening right now that's saying, okay, that's me, but I am the entrepreneur and I'm ready to quit. What do I do next, Steph? Probably work with Beck. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. For reals. Um, it's definitely not my jam. Like, I love that about Success School, your boundaries and how – rock solid you and Tim are about what you are there for and what you are not there for yeah we don't do a lot of like mindset yeah we don't it's not mindset it's don't. not nervous system. It's, no it's business it's strategy this is what you're coming for and come to the calls with this in mind if you need to go and dissolve your shame that's yeah. definitely you sign up today. that's all you yeah like sis that is you and you're amazing at it and you're the best I know at it yeah and like that's your thing yeah that is not my thing yeah not not only do I not know how to do it well it's also not something that I'm interested in yeah. I love strategy I love hacks I love tax I love money yeah and so I want to help you make money but yeah like if you are in business right now you have to do all of the work you don't get to do some of the work you don't just get to do the strategy yeah and you don't just get to do the shame work the mindset work yeah. the heart work the energy work you have to do all of the work mm -hmm. like if you're doing the energy work you're doing the shame work you're doing the mindset work you also have to take fucking action over yeah. here you can't just live there forever yeah and if you're doing all the strategy work and it's not working it's probably an embodiment issue which yeah. means you have to do the self work and like you have to do all of the work at yes. the same time so for the woman who's sitting there and just can't get past the fear right now you got work to do and it's probably not strategy yeah steph gorton mm. that was such an incredible session episode all the things i love spending this time with you if anyone listening to this podcast episode would love to make their way into your world where do we find you come and check me out on insta steph gordon underscore underscore and come listen to our podcast if you're interested in strategy it's all strategy yeah and a bit of banter uh and tim's gonna put up a dancing reel for me <laughs> he uh, you are gonna i reckon you're gonna wear him down I'll crack him. <laughs> i reckon you're gonna wear him down uh, i'm persistent he's not matt rife <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you, Steph.